So today's session is, is about your optimized systems for business growth. Um, and uh, it sounds like a very simple uh, topic, actually, but there's a lot to it. And uh, we would really appreciate your feedback on what we're sharing today as well. Um, this is, the first, well, it's just not the first time. We did actually have a mini conference on Tuesday and um, we shared some of the content. Then also the CBI fortunately asked us to speak yesterday, which was very exciting. So we had an opportunity to speak with, with uh, them and also their audience. And today, what we, I would just say is, like we would say every week, is that we are very much here to support you in your business. And that applies whether you're a company of one, or you're a company literally of a thousand. Uh, we, it's just that it's different. You know, if you're a company of one, you're perhaps surrounded by your own four walls and the people you work with as associates, for example. Um, if you're a company of 1,000, you may have got a board of, several, a board of directors with several people that uh, report, you report to or the other way around. And that in itself can be a pretty lonely journey because there may be certain circumstances where you feel you can't um, open up, as it were. Um, we do want to be here to support you in your, your growth. And if you enjoy these sessions, um, uh, you know, we obviously are very appreciative for any shares or likes, but only if you feel you want to do that. And uh, the big thing with that is it also helps us too to get the message out to a much wider audience. So that's always appreciated. Um, today is also about building valued connections based on what we class as a deep relationship of trust. And that really is vital because in reality, especially if you um, are offering a higher ticket proposition, people won't tend to buy from you unless there is a deep relationship of trust there. Mm -hmm. So everything we do and everything we encourage our clients to do is uh, very much focusing on that. And if you do things the right way, you can actually form some collective groups and work together, and that can really uh, help. Now, um, again, I've said this just before we started today, uh, but do share what you're passionate about. Um, everything has to start with you as a person. If that then replicates through into your business, even better. Uh, a little bit why you do it, and there will be a why there somewhere. And that's probably the part that's seen you through over the last 12 months with all the you know, everything disruption and such will be going on. And obviously be bold with your questions. We do like people to ask difficult questions. Um, I've set myself up there, but, uh, you know, give it a good go. And um, very quick introduction for myself. Business Growth Bureau was formed about eight years ago. Uh, yes, yeah, seven or eight years ago. I've lost track now. Um, and we've uh, very keen on supporting both uh, our clients, uh, partners, associates, employees, Etc. And you'll notice we put down suppliers as well uh, as prospects because the important thing is if you make everyone feel really good about the relationship, it tends to uh, stand you in good stead and people are much more likely then to also want to transact and work with you. Uh, Mural, do you want to give yourself a little bit of an introduction? I will do. Just take myself from mute. Hello, everyone. Nice of you to join us. Um, I'm I'm passionate really about building relationships with people. I love having conversations with people and helping them, um, and just understanding you know what they're all about and how we can help them and make life easier. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. I think Muriel is slightly played, played down playing herself actually because behind the scenes, Muriel is make is the person that makes sure everything happens, uh, especially. Uh, we're working with our clients and uh, making sure everything's working like clockwork. Um, so uh, thank you for that introduction. And I won't go into a massive detail about myself, but uh, uh, obviously I've got a lovely wife called Wendy. That's my son who loves uh, playing chess. He's 24 and unfortunately he's probably a lot cleverer than I am. And uh, he's a continual uh, competition as to who's going to beat each other at chess. But uh, we, we have a, a little bit of a blitz on that where we might have a few games over a couple of weeks, then we don't play it for six months. Uh, and um, when when the great outdoors does really open up, then I've got my electric mountain bike, which is uh, a lot of fun. And we we love uh, dogs and cats. So that's our dog called Gus. Um, and uh, in terms of what we plan to discuss today, today is very much about your optimized system of business growth, as I already explained. And it's going to be covering why knowing your numbers is vital to working out your strategy. Is your brand and value proposition at the center of everything you do? And why you should amplify your brand to get your message out there and, and how behind it? And what is the perfect social selling blueprint for sales success? And why should making clients feel special be a key, a key part of your growth strategy, as well as being the right thing to do and everything else that goes around it? Uh, now, I'm going to just pause for a quick second before we do get to... Uh, properly started just to make sure I haven't missed anything 
um, anything very obvious. So just a few quick hellos. So um, uh, <laughs> dodgy barbers, Terry. I don't know whether that's the interesting one. Uh, Simon, the great, great you've been able to join us today. Charlotte as well. Um, yes, Scotland's west coast, uh, southwest coast. Uh, great. And then we've got Daniel as well, which is uh, uh, November to March. Really only surviving, treading water, paying the bills, feeding the children, not doing any growth or development work. So, Daniel, mm -hmm. no doubt we can discuss that with you next week when we speak, as it were. Um, and Mike, uh, welcome. It's nice to see you here. And Tom from sunny Cyprus. So uh, hopefully no snow in Cyprus, uh, like we've us about a couple of weeks ago. So in which case, we'll get started, but do keep on asking those questions. And um, uh, what we plan to cover today, the, the meat behind in the bone, as it were, this is really all the detail. Um, and the reason this week we're doing a little bit differently to the previous weeks, because normally we might have a session for ourselves, uh, perhaps every two or three months. But in real terms, there's some quite big changes coming in with, within Business uh, Growth Bureau. Um, those of you who know me well, um, and obviously a number of you do, uh, will be very familiar with the fact that our service centred around what we class the social selling blueprint, which is lead generation, prospect nurturing, and sales optimization, And a lot of that uh, is around LinkedIn. And then uh, with the help and support of our members in November, December last year, we ran some focus groups as we were looking to further extend our service around brand amplification. So from January the 1st, that was launched, and that's been very, very well received. Um, and uh, very excitingly, as we've been speaking to other people, we've realized or very much recognized the fact that businesses typically need more support. And where this is very relevant, a lot of people don't think very strategically about these things. And therefore, they end up by running their business in, in really quite an in a inefficient way. Um, and of course, if your value and brand proposition isn't right to start with, then potentially you're, you're scaling a problem. You're not building on the, your core strength, both as a person, as a founder of the business, or within you know, your business overall. So people may not be understanding your core message. And then, so we're adding that module in from the, uh, giving people the option of that from the uh, 1st of June. And then it, before that, um, in fact, you could argue it's a chicken and egg because it could come the other way around. What we class your strategic guidance system. So I'll explain a lot more about that in a moment. And what we sort of very much recognize too is a lot of people really struggle. And what we class, if they, they struggle quite often getting leads and nurturing as leads into hot prospects. But when people do get those hot prospects, quite often they're not really very good on closing those opportunities down. And in fact, I was having a conversation with someone only three days ago, and he got some like 23 really hot leads come through. And he just got overwhelmed with other things he was doing, mainly because they had a couple of bereavements in the family, etc. For understandably, that had an impact, very big impact. Um, but as a consequence, those, a lot of those leads will have gone cold. But the thing is, is also knowing how to nurture those uh, hot prospects and turning those into sales and also then making that those customers feel really valued, so they want to build from there. So you'll notice that the uh, that you've got the strategic guidance system, value brand optimization system, and the client enhancement referral systems are completely new. Um, and uh, so we've got lots of exciting things to share with you on that. Uh, now, if we look at the strategic guidance systems uh, to start start with, um, it can't be. You, you've got to have uh, someone in a, a plane there or driving a very high-tech vehicle or whatever it may be. But it's, it's, at the bottom line is if you are you know, flying a plane, you've got your, your dials, all your instruments there, actually telling you in the cockpit what's going on and obviously helps you get to your destination, but also makes sure you get there safely as well. And um, so if we look at that part first of all, um, the really important thing is to make sure that you have effectively a business plan. Now, traditionally, a business plan would be, you know, perhaps a meaty 15, 20, 30 page documents or even more. And the trouble, trouble with a lot of business plans, they get stuck in the drawer once you've used it, for perhaps raising finance or whatever it is you're planning to do. They get stuck in a drawer. They don't get looked at again, perhaps for six months or a year or even ever. What we're talking about here is actually you should have like a one page dashboard which repl uh, replicates um, the, your, the core essence of what your pl business plan actually is. 
And the same applies really with your marketing plan. Do you need to have your key numbers there in terms of what you're doing, where it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, it might be running events in normal circumstances. Um, it might be using direct mail through the post, it, whatever your strategy is, you need to have like a, a really a one page dashboard there so you can got all your measurements there. And then indeed the same thing really applies to your sales process. Because the thing is, if you don't know how you're spending your money, uh, you, you therefore don't know what your return investment is. And clearly, if you're putting in a pound into a slot machine, you know it's going to give you £10 back. Um, if you got any sense, of course, you're going to keep on putting money in the slot machine. And I'm not suggesting gambling there by any chance. It's completely contrary, but you, you get the point. So that's absolutely crucial. The uh, If we then look at the value brand optimization systems, um, what we say there, that's very much revolves around you as a person, you as the founders of the business, what's important for you. Um, because at the end of the day, your value and brand, your, your personal value and your brand, if you're the founder of the business especially, that needs to come across very much in the running of your business in the sense of your values and uh, your brand essence and your mission and vision and purpose, as it were. And a very good place to start, actually, is if you look at the United Nations uh, 17 core values, which is that graphic on the bottom right there, um, just choose perhaps one or two or three of those which you feel a close alignment to. And you could almost make that part of your, your overall brand essence, if I can put it that way. Now, we had Barnaby Winter on the live stream last week. And if you missed that, I would urge you to go back and watch the previous recording of that, uh, which uh, you can see on our website under the TV video section and look at previous videos. You might need to go back a couple of videos just to see it, uh, but it's there and you'll find that really helpful in terms of what we're talking about brand and value optimization. The other part of this, and this actually also works under the client enhancement referral system as well, is you need to look at all those people around you um, who you feel also aligned with and the other way around. So where they buy into your mission and vision and we're very lucky because actually several people on this call today um, are actually customers of ours or clients of ours. And, you know, we actually love our uh, uh, customers or clients. And we you know the, the really great thing is they're really supportive of us. But if you can do that in the right way, then people, of course, want to see you succeed and you want to see them succeed. Um, now, obviously, this gentleman here, Neil Lawson, uh, you probably don't, many of you don't know of him, but he's a serial adventurer. He's done over 52 expeditions. He's been up Everest five times. Uh, he's, he's one of his best friends is Bear Grylls, who's a photograph there of him there. He's been on our live stream a couple of times. And also he's a record breaker. So um, he broke the Guinness World of Records by hosting a dinner party at 22,000 feet. Now he's ex uh, special forces. Um, so obviously an amazing man. I know what he's got planned for next year. And it's pretty exciting. We'll probably bring him on air over the next few weeks to talk about. Um, also, if you look at uh, someone else, you know, on the face of it, very ordinary, ordinary, doing something amazing. So you've got Danny McCaskill, and he's uh, on, on his uh, bike, being down the slabs in the Isle of Skye, uh, which I'm sure Charlotte probably knows extremely well on this call. Um, and it's worth just looking up that the YouTube clip. Actually, it's about five minutes, but it's a real high adrenaline. A clip and also there's some other footage they're showing um, a different uh, YouTube video which explains how it was all done and how they managed to get that footage but of course uh, he's got a massive following um, just like Neil Lawson has as well and but you don't have to be a big name to make a difference um, obviously there's lots of people who've uh, very ordinary people done amazing things and we can obviously mention uh, you know Sir Tom uh, which of course we know from last year uh, we also know people like Marcus Rashford as well. Forgot the name right there. And, of course, our extraordinary people within the NHS. So just ordinary people doing amazing things. Um, and then in terms of some of our clients um, as well. So if we just look quickly at those, um, Claire Burrows runs a call centre um, in Southborough Street, Tunbridge Wells. And uh, we helped to get 11 new clients in the first six months. Um, also, Michael Romling, who's been on the live stream several times, actually, um, we helped him to get £160,000 worth of business in the first 10 months as a one-person business. He was very happy with that. And uh, Adam Molson from Form 3, I don't know whether you've noticed this actually, but your bank, um, instead of taking perhaps several hours to process payments, in many cases, they are actually taking seconds or minutes. And that's like even interbank transfers. Uh, now, um, uh, Form 3 
uh, provide a technology platform to enable that to happen, which the banks have bought into. And not surprisingly, their, their proposition starts for about £300,000. And typically, some of them are paying four or five million pounds for it. And it's a very complex sale because it requires multiple sign off by multiple stakeholders and probably the CEO of the bank as well. And the reason being is that it's not just the investment, that's actually the small part of it. But from a PR point of view, if suddenly the cash machine stopped working or money didn't hit people's accounts in time, you can imagine the, the bad publicity that would come from that. Now, you might say, why am I mentioning that? Well, partly as you'd expect, is about to install, um, you know, to explain a bit more about the credibility of what we're talking about. But it's also about the fact that these are um, people who are running business very successfully and, you know, achieving amazing results. Um, and then if you look at your value brand part of it, it really think starts about your why, your story, your brand vision, mission and purpose, your social values and your customers. And you need to make sure that you're well aligned uh, from a business and a market perspective. And with that as well, we suggest that you also create um, video content and we can actually help you with that. And also reputation enhancement. So getting you know really good case studies, video case studies from your customers, and even perhaps going a stage further and saying, look, there's gonna be a separate seg segment here. I just want to record, um, just if you to tell us exactly what you think, this won't be used anywhere, but it is very, very useful to quite often you get little tips that your, your clients are the best people to speak to. So the first people we speak to are always our existing clients because they will tell you what they think, you know, because they, if they, they, because they fundamentally care and also as a benefit for them, they're some of the best people to speak to in terms of you know, real-time R&D. So you don't necessarily need to pay for that research. The next part really is to do with brand amplification, um, which we're focusing on now. Um, and if you look at this as a case in point, you just need to bear in mind that um, if you use social media for as a case in point, you, um, uh, you, you know, so we, we have a very blessed, we've got, we're very lucky because we've got these great platforms that are available to us. And there's so many means of reaching potential customers now. We're actually as very, very spoilt for choice. Um, and uh, the difficulty though is a lot of people get very overwhelmed. Uh, for example, we obviously got a new social network spring up recently called Clubhouse. Now, Clubhouse is great. Having said that, it also could be a big time suck. Uh, it could be a real time vampire because people get hooked on it. And as a consequence, um, you've got to ask yourself, are you doing this for your own personal benefit and gain in terms of self-enrichment? Or are you doing it because you're actually also want to help other people and potentially pick up some clients as well? And that's always a delicate balance. Um, and remember with the social media platforms as well, is if something is free, and this is a really important thing to understand, you are the asset and the commodity. You are, you are the person or the thing, if I could put it that way, that generates the money for the platforms, hence they give it to you for free. Um, and with these platforms, typically you either invest your time or you invest your money or you or you invest both. Um, and and if, again, if something is tends to be only free, if you don't value your time. So just remember that because that's, I, I've been really caught like this as well. And I think many of us is, too as well. So it's worth just bearing that in mind. So the, um, uh, so it's really important as well as your, your marketing efforts, you put everything in place to leverage and scale uh, those parts of it and do it in such a way uh, to get your time back. Um, now uh, we haven't got time today to do this um, or at least I don't think we have. Uh, but there's a, a great video clip, which is about three or four minutes long. And uh, this, is a, a, this, is, this is a selection of all, uh, Disney movies, which have come out from 1947 to the current day. And if you actually were to look at these videos, uh, these um, clips side by side, you'd be absolutely staggered by the amount of um, clips which have been reused multiple times. Now, it, on the face of it, it looks completely different. But if you actually look at the people or the children, or the animals, or the creatures, and then look at their movements, they're almost identical. And that, it, obviously these days, technology companies like Disney, of course, can do everything on very high spec um, computer equipment, and they've got the benefit of being able to tap into their vast resources. But in the old days, of course, everything had to be done by you know hand and hand drawn. Um, so, but if Disney are doing this all the time and repurposing content, 
then you need to think about what you're doing as well to see whether you can repurpose what you're doing, but consider do it in such a way to really amplify your reach. So around that, um, what we uh, recommend is, for example, a lot of people write content and put posts out, say, on LinkedIn or it might be Facebook or whatever it may be. Now, that's great, and it's great for getting your brand out there. The difficulty is it's organic. It can take quite a bit of time, and you have to, uh, you have to do it over a sustained period. What we say is it's actually much better to start off with, say, a video interview or live stream or where, where perhaps you've spoken on stage somewhere, something that demonstrates your credibility, authority, and it, I mean, it shouldn't be a sales pitch. It should be something sharing genuine value. And then what you can do is you can broadcast that live simultaneously across the different channels like YouTube, Facebook Live, Periscope, so it's Twitter now, um, and uh, you know LinkedIn, et cetera. And uh, what you can then do is to say, okay, that was great. What we'll do is we'll edit it down a little bit. Uh, so an hour-long hour production, for example, may actually come down to 45, 50 minutes. You then rebroadcast that, say, two weeks later. Okay, so you get a bit of double bubble on the same platforms. Uh, and uh, what you can then do is to say, okay, well, I'll do a slight repurpose again. We'll put that as a podcast, and then you can put that out across, say, the different uh, podcasting channels, um, all simultaneously, perhaps all summarize to them at the same time. And then, of course, you can use leverage social media to get that message out there. Um, obviously, a lot of us who've been running physical events before have switched to online. And I would just say on that point, get, get ready for the new hybrid world that we're moving to. So we will be going back to running physical events again. Uh, but many people, of course, like the choice um, or like a bit of a hybrid approach you know, where it's a, perhaps real time events with real people where you can meet them uh, versus online. The two are very complementary to each other. And of course, uh, webinars can be great um, uh, if you can build them in such a way that there could be an element of automation there. So they are just on just in time, as it were then the great thing with that is, again, you're scaling your time, getting that back. And if you use it, I would suggest not using it the way a lot of internet marketers do. A lot of internet marketers will say you can pay X amount on Facebook ads. If you do ABC, you will get this return investment. The tr thing is, a lot of those uh, teachings that are shared may have worked three, four, five, six years ago, but these days the world has moved on, and the trouble is people keep on repaddling the same old stuff. So what we'd say is a lot of these things like um, just-in-time webinars or automated webinars are best to do when you've already had a human interaction beforehand, whether that's a phone call or a video call, or you might have even met them. Okay, so just bear that in mind. And um, you can sell from webinars. Uh, and there are some people who feel very gifted where you can do it. The vast majority of probably 99% of us, it is much more difficult to do. So if you share value that way, um, what you can do as well is then uh, use uh, diagnostic tools to help qualify people to make sure you're spending time appropriately. But also from all the content that's been created, you can uh, then uh, turn that into transcripts, turn that into a downloadable report. You can then take extracts from that report, turn, turn that into posts and articles. So that, that can be a really worthwhile thing to do. And this is why we say, run, do something which is one-to-one. -one. So one might, might be one pod article or post which goes on LinkedIn. And all right, you might manually then put it out through Facebook as well, et cetera, as a case in point. Why not think more strategically and think about how you can get it out across multiple platforms, but also multiple media channels, um, either simultaneously or relatively short uh, succession. Um, and then if you move a little bit further on from it, the social selling blueprint, which of course is where we really started out uh, some years ago, um, it's also before you do that, and we can help you with this, is make sure you've got a balanced product portfolio and also you've got your marketing mix right and that you're following methodology under the social selling blueprint. Now, we do talk about this a lot more and we shed a lot of value on the mini conference about it, but in sort of general terms, you need to make sure that you're, You've got a good suite of products. Uh, you've got your pricing right. If your products pricing is too high, people may not buy from you. If your pricing is too low, people people quite often will use price as an anchor to actually determine the value they're going to get. So if you've got a really premium brand and they started to heavily discount, 
you probably would be a little bit suspicious of that. You might well actually seize the opportunity. The trouble is when they've tried to put their prices back up again to what it should be, they've, they've actually shot themselves in the foot. And there's plenty of opportunities, examples of that where that's gone wrong. Uh, now, you've got research. You could pay for market research. Um, actually, your customers will tell you uh, straight off the bat what works. Um, if you're not 100% sure, test and evaluate something in the market. See whether people start to buy. If they do, build it out. If they don't, then go back and, and see what you can refine. Then your product proposition, your desire, product desirability, make sure that is wanted in the marketplace, and your product mix, and so on. So that's worth all looking at. And then if we look at your balanced product portfolio, um, so on that, uh, what you need to do is look at what products you share for free. Uh, now, in our case, we use uh, live streams every Thursday. Uh, at this time, we have different live streams. We normally have a different guest speaker each week. Uh, unfortunately for you, you've got me this week, um, but there we go. Um, you've then got your foundation products. Um, the foundation products would tend to be the entry point and would be the part which then leads into someone then buying a core product. I would normally go into a lot more detail. I'll touch on that in a second, uh, but obviously I need to make sure we stick to time, as it were. Um, but the foundation products are really key because some people will need to come in and test drive you on a foundation-type product. In other cases, there may be a slight budgetary constraint at this point in time, so they may come in on that and then upgrade to a core products later on. And the core products will be the ones which are the cash cows, which generate that continual revenue for you. And then you've got products for upsells and cross-sells, which, um, which are particularly suitable to your existing customer base. Um, and also you can incorporate products which may be really good for member, get member offers. So, um, and then if we look a little bit at your marketing mix, um, it's about um, making sure that people are aware that you exist um, look at your ideal clients in terms of what they look like. Understand the profile of those clients. Look at your competition. Uh, but with one big thing there it, on the competition side, um, be very careful not to run your business looking in the rearview mirror. Okay, If you start looking over your shoulder, looking at the competition, what will happen is you'll end up by designing things which are actually no better than the competition. And also the difficulty is you're working uh, historically what is in the past or up to current day rather than being different and actually standing out from the competition so you only move ahead by looking through the your windscreen not through the rear view mirror okay rear view mirror is great for password learning but just be aware that not to focus on that too much because it really distracts you make sure you've got a lot of differentiation uh, your company position is right uh, great and everything else that goes with that so um, what we uh, also would suggest is you very much focus that any outreach you do is that starts from for, so every hundred cold leads that you reach out to, that you can put, put in place strategies to generate 10 hot prospects in your chosen target market. And there are ways you can do this without spending any money on pay-per-click. Um, obviously, that can be a good option to do, uh, depending on what markets you're in. But there, it isn't always necessary to do that. We can share lots of strategies where you can do that, which are very effective and give a quick return investment. Also, make sure you focus on attracting the higher value customers um, where possible. Um, a lot of people price themselves down to the bottom and therefore they can't put the auction mask themselves. Um, and leverage your time so you can get more billable work and crucially build um, scale into everything you do in your business. That's really, really important. Otherwise, you're running a lifestyle business and you're going to find it very difficult to get out of that uh, trap. And understand as well that uh, the snowball effect uh, with, with marketing. So you need to give things time for campaigns to compound out. And bear in mind that um, as a case in point, you know, you may start speaking to a customer, a prospect uh, today. Um, they may come back in two, three months' time and say, yes, the time is right now. We've got budget available to do it. They might come back at six, nine, 12 months later. And if you speak to someone like Terry as well, who's on this call today, he'll no doubt tell you about some of the very high-value propositions that he sold, or in fact, Alex Rin, who's also on this call today, um, about some of the very high-value propositions, where sometimes they can take years to come through. But, of course, the bottom line is you've been festering, uh, fostering, sorry, it's a much better word, fostering those relationships. 
then of course people will spend money where then it's right. So a lot of people in the sales environment will give up on this, perhaps the second attempt, might be the third if you're very lucky. The difficulty is you're just warming people up to go to a competitor, which of course is not what you want at all. Um, and then the other part around this is looking, put in place strategies um, to bring your sales forward, amplify your brand and get your time back. And we've got a, a great little um, solution for you, which does precisely that. And guess what it's called? It's called the Biz Growth Time Machine, okay? Because it does precisely that. So we can give you a technological solution where you're in full control of the process. So you've got your, your nice BMW uh, or Mercedes or Land Rover, or whatever is your poison, as it were, uh, with a high performance engine, with your satellite navigation, with your radar control. Um, and apart from doing the uh, acceleration, sorry, even that is a bit automatic these days, apart from actually making sure you stay on course, and therefore you keep control of the steering wheel, they, if you put the postcode in the sat-nav um, and you follow the guidance in there, then fundamentally it will always get to your destination. Even if you go off course multiple times, it will still get you to your destination. But the crucial thing is you need to keep a hold of that steering wheel. You need to always be in full control. So automation is great, but the big thing is to remember you're always interacting with human beings, and as such, people should be treated that way. Um, obviously, this is well. This is designed to particularly integrate with LinkedIn, and on LinkedIn, there's, it's actually 675 million records. Actually, not 650 uh, people on. There's 25 million people on the platform in the UK alone, and the targeting you can do can be incredibly powerful. Um, okay, and um, you, but also the other thing which is really useful, you can actually export the data from BizGrowth Time Machine. And subject to GDPR compliance, and I obviously have to stress that because it's important you do things the right way, um, you will typically, out of any campaigns you run, whether they have become connected to you, find that you, you can you will be able to also um, uh, gather some business email addresses and also uh, business phone numbers. This is where people have set their information to being publicly available on their LinkedIn profile. But as I say, do, I will stress that's very much done to you and it's it's subject to gdpr compliance if you do things the right way it is compliant do it the wrong way of course you can get to your difficulties the other thing which to bear in mind is um these days technology has moved on a lot so for example you can now send messages out which have got hyper personalized video messages in there or or images in there so for example you could have an image which appears on the graphic which is their image with a personalized message that goes out to them and it's actually embedded within the image itself and that's done in real time now that's not part of the standard service but that can be built in and typically most people will actually save between 10 and about save 10 times on what they'd normally spend doing manually so a job which would take three to five hours you're running a full campaign paying for an outsourced resource perhaps like a virtual assistant of some kind um, and with all the complexities of that you can literally reduce that down to about 15 minutes a day. Okay. Now, obviously, we do suggest you manually pre-check all the data that you people you wanted to engage with, but it has that level of impact if you do things the right way. Um, uh, there's a few quick graphics there of how that works. Uh, we're not going to do a demo today because we haven't got the time unless the people particularly are asking us to do it. Um, and then on this part here, everything falls under what we class as social selling blueprint. Um, uh, it's very important that people have help on the marketing, the marketing mix and the, uh, their balanced product portfolio. And we provide a lot of support around that. And that's the services built into um, anything we sort of do with uh, clients sort of moving forwards. Um, now, I feel I've gone at a, a, sort of a, a breakneck speed. Um, what I'm going to do in a moment, I will take a bit of a pause. So if you've got questions, please do drop them in the chat. Um, it keeps everything really moving. If, if I don't answer them straight away, I will try and get to every question. And so bear with me. And I'll be taking a natural break in about two or three minutes just to uh, do that as well. So um, the first thing, if you look at the lead generation side part of it for a moment, th this is quite an insightful graphic. OK, now this is um, graphic probably is a bit more relevant where you are a company with several business development managers. OK, but actually applies also if you're a company of one. OK, um, so what tends to happen is a lot of people will try and reach people cold. OK, and that can be very, very time consuming and also really burn people out. 
So, so what happens is that um, about 65% of your time may be spent on working on cold prospects um, or actually prospecting itself. And there's a really big hidden cost there because the average business development resource will perhaps take six months before they become really experienced in what you're doing. If they get frustrated, they will just go on and leave. And then you've got all the recruitment costs, all the training costs, and everything else like that again. Okay. Whereas if you go about it the other way around, then you'll be working about 65% of the time. It's got a far engine go by there. 65% uh, of the time, you're able to spend working on hot, qualified prospects. And of course, that means either you as the sales director or the managing director, if you're a very small business, um, or your business development managers um, are therefore going over their sales targets. The company is really happy because they're breaching their, um, their own performance targets as well for that period. And also what you find is have a much happier workforce and also that people will stay with you a lot longer as a consequence. So it's really worth thinking about that part of it. And just as a bit of an indicator to you as well, um, if you look at where our opportunities come from, now bear in mind, um, you would think that email would be the biggest part out of this lot, especially if I tell you what 58,000 marketable business contacts in our system. Um, we've got about 13,000, which are a hard core of marketable contacts, okay? Um, but that only accounts 25% of what we do. Referrals are about 9%. That's simply because all the other activities we do tend to dwarf that part of it. But obviously, very always very grateful for that. Uh, the surprise is Facebook and Instagram is only about 5%. Um, I will explain a bit more about that in a second. And LinkedIn um, has, generates over 61% of our revenue. In fact, several of you on the call today, um, I think uh, without exception, I think Terry is one, uh, Alex Ren, uh, I think several others of you on this call today, actually have, we've got to know initially through LinkedIn and some of the best partnerships we've formed have actually originated from LinkedIn. So it's not just about bringing in sales and business, but it's all these fantastic people you have conversations with as well. Now, Facebook and Instagram, if you, it's interesting because obviously we're serving predominantly other businesses or charities, um, okay? Um, but with Facebook and Instagram, where that can be really good is uh, if you're in the business, business space, for example, on retargeting. So you may be running a campaign uh, through LinkedIn and by email, for what, it, for example, as a case in point. And but what you can do is when people hit your website, uh, Facebook Pixel will pick that up, and people can be retargeted uh, with ads. And that can be surprisingly low cost and quite effective. There is a slight cloud on the horizon with that because um, uh, Apple, through iOS 14, have um, decided to change some of their privacy settings, um, so it makes it a little bit more difficult. But overall, that can work very well. Now, obviously, if you're in the business to consumer space, so you're selling products or widgets to, to end users, if I can put it that way, uh, probably badly said, then obviously Facebook and Instagram will work very well. Um, and potentially Twitter and you've also got other platforms as well uh, tied in with that. Um, what you may well find, though, is that you may want to reach um, people which are perhaps wholesalers or distributors or resellers or uh, of some kind, uh, or partners or sponsors, and you'll tend to find those are much easier to reach on LinkedIn. So even if we're in the business consumer space, very relevant. And um, we're speaking to a, a confectionery company at the moment, which obviously by default would be more selling to individuals. But actually, because of what they offer, it's also very relevant for the corporate sector, for the larger SMEs, for and even the medium-sized one for Christmas gifts, um, retail outlets, and so on. Um, so having a blended approach to your marketing strategy can work particularly well. And then around this part of it, also make sure you're clear on your avatar profiles as well. Um, we can help you with that. Obviously, LinkedIn is great for demographic data. Facebook, Instagram, great for psychographics. OK, and don't worry if you don't understand that. We can obviously explain that to you if you've got any questions around it. And um, you'll find out of that 147 industry sectors on LinkedIn, about 120 of those work really well. But you need to think about who you're going to reach out to. And you also need to know how to use the search tools uh, properly because uh, a lot of people actually, there's some real, real gotchas with the search. If you do it wrong, you can end up with a lot of people which are not in your target market. It may look fairly okay to start with. 
if you do it, do it the right way, you can filter by turnover and things like that as well, which you, you, you couldn't originally do. And that can help you to be much more laser focused in terms of the people you're reaching out, especially as 95% of businesses employ less than 10 people. So just bear in mind what I was saying, that's 95% of businesses employ in the UK employ less than 10 people. It's very similar stats in the US. It's just the numbers are a lot bigger because it's six times the population. So obviously we talked about um, Facebook, Instagram, Google to a degree today. Um, and uh, I haven't got much time to drill down on that today, unfortunately. Um, but the good thing is here, you don't, you can spend money on pay-per-click, but to get really good results, you actually don't need to. Um, if you do pay-per-click advertising, you need to make sure that your landing pages, and you can't typically get away with just one now, you typically have, need to have multiple landing pages or landing pages which are heavily um, personalized according to the key phrases or keywords you use. Because if you don't, Google will penalize you because they'll you'll get large page rankings. Um, and as a consequence, what will happen is you'll pay a lot more per click. Um, okay, and if you get it, if people don't opt into something, then of course uh, it's much more difficult to then uh, bring people into your fold where they may actually then ultimately want to buy something. So um, I think we've come to a little bit of a natural break to deal with some questions. Um, it looks as if we've still got a lot more to do. I'm pleased to say we actually are sticking roughly to time, um, but let's just. Uh, have a quick look. Um, Mirror, some questions here. What sort of Yeah, Ter Terry's asked, although I think you've mostly really covered this one, what can business owners do to get their message out there? Uh, right, that's a really good point. Well, hopefully I've largely covered that, Terry. Obviously, tell me if I haven't, and obviously if you can be a bit more specific, that'd be uh, really helpful. Um, the, the good news, there are lots of free ways where you can, you can do that, which I've already explained. Um, uh, and, but the crucial thing is to make sure you use technology and also do things the right way so you're maximizing your return investment. So whatever your billable rate, there's a very good guide on this. Let's say your billable rate is you know, 150 pounds per hour. If you're spending your, your 150 pounds an hour uh, or 200 pounds an hour, whatever it is, uh, and you're doing tasks which you pay someone else to, to do it perhaps 10 or 15 pounds an hour, clearly that is not good use of your time. And yet we come across so many people who do precisely that. So so I'm, Terry, if I haven't answered that properly, does, um, uh, you know, how does it do that? Um, so, right, Simon okay. says, oh, right, Clubhouse, is that right? Uh, yeah, Simon Brown. Um, is Clubhouse worth getting involved in? He's been asked to start a room, but he's not sure whether it's worth investing his time and effort into that. Okay, that's a really good point. I have to say, Simon, I share my, I've got a similar question to you on that one. And in fact, one or two of our clients actually do spend quite a bit of time in Clubhouse. Um and I think if you're in the coaching mentoring space, then Clubhouse can be a quite a good place to be in. Um, and also, you know, it can be good for picking up some really good tips for your business. So I don't want to get in a position knocking Clubhouse because I think there is some mileage in there. And we, we ourselves will be looking at it. But when we do do it, we will be doing it very strategically. And we'll probably give our clients the first opportunity to get involved with that as well. Um, so, Simon, do um, if you've got any thoughts on that, perhaps uh, – you know, perhaps we'll in a 15 minute call or something. We could have a bit of a catch up about that. Um, so, um, so Terry is also asking about, uh, bit me a second, stay relevant in the new world, or we cover that. Yeah, so Terry said he's covered that. We covered that. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, Alex made the point about festering versus fostering. Brilliant. It's important to recognize when something is festering, whether it doesn't qualify out. And we'll, that's a really good point, Alex, actually. Uh, I love that because it's so easy to spend time. I love having conversations with people and I have to pinch myself all the time because a lot of the time I enjoy speaking to people, but the difficulty is are they ever gonna become customers? Um, and if they're never, not gonna become customers, then it's about trying to share value uh, in a way which is scalable for you so you can make people feel really valued, but it's not costing your time because we all, that's our most precious resource. Uh, so thank you very much for that one. And uh, Renata, I'm expecting, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, there we go. Let's bring this up. Um, are you ready for, for a world post LinkedIn? If one day Microsoft changed the game to more of, of their benefit, a second best. Yeah, really, Renata, that's another really good one because um, LinkedIn are playing with um, some different algorithms at the moment. And we're actually keeping a very close eye on that. In fact, our, software partners as well. 
Okay, and uh, we've got some uh, partners up with this, this software partner who's actually got some data analysts working on this precise question, this point. This is one of the reasons we say actually f not just, not basing on quality, quantity so much with LinkedIn, but look at the quality of what you're doing. Okay, and that's really important. The other thing is if you're building a message uh, set based on perhaps a seven message step process rather than say a three step messaging process, not you're you're then built, relationship building at a much more personal level, at a deeper level, and therefore you're making everything work much harder for you. Now, where LinkedIn get a bit uh, hissy are uh, on the number of connection requests you send out. Okay, if you're building on follow, if it's follow up messages are going out um, in response to some inquiry or some interest, then LinkedIn are much more relaxed about it. You don't tend to get problems with that. Um, but uh, Renata, if you want to take off the line, then do, that, that you've raised a really good point and uh, we're well aware of that. And I can assure you, we work very well with closely with all our clients to make sure they always stay on the right side of LinkedIn, not risk um, perhaps doing something which uh, inadvertently shouldn't be doing, let's put it that way. Uh, so um, do keep those questions coming. Um, and uh, what we'll do is, uh, I've got about another seven or eight minutes worth of contact. We'll do a little bit of a wrap up. We'll have some more Q&A as well at the end. So keep putting those questions in there. Uh, if you enjoy what you're doing, if you could very kindly share today, it'd be really appreciated, uh, but only if you're enjoying it. And I always really appreciate that. Um, so moving on from here. Um, right. Uh, now, th this also will answer your question a little bit about the depth. Now, because of time challenges, I can't go into real depth um, time on this. Um, but what I would say is this is a really good example of a seven message process. Uh, so you've got your initial connection request. And when someone accepts that, you send a thank you message. And it shouldn't, shouldn't be overtly sales-based. You share value. Uh, if you've got a, a one-page PDF, it shares some, some more genuine value, not a sales document. Uh, or it could be a link to a video, which, again, is sharing value. That's great to put in a thank you message to. Now, you'll find some people start to express interest at that stage. Um, more typically, people don't because we're all busy. Um, if you then, perhaps a week or so later, then I'll send a message out with a qualifying question. Uh, just look at their profile or look at a bit what they do and think of a really good qualifying question. Some more people will come out of that stage and say, yes, I'd love to have a conversation, in which case take people off the platform as quickly as possible. If they still haven't engaged, don't worry about it. That's fine. About a week or so later, um, share something which a little bit is a little bit more of a pitch, but still very soft. And what we suggest in there, it shares a little bit more about you personally and your organization. And with that, you also have a downloadable PDF, it might be a white paper or a thought leadership piece. Again, not a sales document. That's really important. You remember the clue is in the word, it's a social network. Okay. So share something of value. And, um, or it could be a link to a video or whatever it may be. And uh, then put your contact details on that one. Generally, we suggest not doing it on that one. We would suggest doing so. If some, you get more people engaging with that and thanking you for that and asking questions, if they haven't asked the question, then go in with a different qualifying question, perhaps, say, seven days later. And it could be a bit later on. You then invite people to complete an agnostic and a discovery call. The big thing is don't rely on automation just in its own right. The human element is so important. So the moment that people put, uh, put their hands up, literally get people off the platform as quickly as possible. So offer to share something more of value or sure a short discovery call, whatever it may be, just get the human interaction going um, and that makes a massive difference. Uh, now the good news, a lot of this is taken care of through Time Machine because that's designed to uh, always fail on safe. So when someone uh, personally replies, it will automatically stop on that one person so you can uh, take control uh, of, of that response and make sure it's always dealt with appropriately. And the sales optimization part of it, uh, the crucial thing is to make sure you know your numbers. Okay. Now, um, again, we're a little bit restricted for time here, but if you've got an accountant which charges £10,000 a year, or let's say you're a SaaS business, you know, software as a service business, um, and say over five years, the same customer generates £35,000 over the five years. If you were to run a, a one-year campaign and you wanted three sales per month, that one-year campaign would have the potential, based on these numbers, if you get a calculator out, these numbers are 100% correct, £360,000 or dollars in the first year, 
three years, 900,000, five years, 1.26 million, okay? Um, obviously, you just change those numbers to what's relevant for you. Um, if, if you haven't completed a diagnostic, one of our Bisco Cells Diagnostics, we'd highly recommend you do so. And you could actually create something very much like this yourself as well. Now, with those, it's always about sharing uh, value. Um, and then around that, make sure on your sales optimization side that um, you've got a, a continual value share. You've got a test drive tool so people can feel they're making a very safe decision. Um, you could also have got some presentation techniques which are, are designed to very much engage and interact with the potential client, um, but strong, be strong on the qualifying and closing techniques. Now, obviously, if you're in a more um, higher end, higher ticket sales thing, sales process, then actually getting this right is really crucial because you don't want to do the closing part too early because then you come across uh, someone who sells. You're not then focused on the customer. But if you do it the right way, you know, at the end of the day, you also have to ask for the business. If someone wants to interact with you and buy from you, uh, don't, don't be frightened of asking for the business because you um, as uh, Zig Ziglar said, um, I haven't read much of his stuff, but he's got he's very much described um, a sales resource as being the honoured profession. Okay, because at the end of the day, if a business doesn't generate sales, it's going to go bust. And equally, you can't be there to serve other customers. Um, then on the final part of it, it's really about making sure that you look after your customers to the best of your ability. So if you look at this, uh, 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 sorry, coffee shop in London. This was in February last year before lockdown. Uh, down that street, four or five other coffee shops, they were all virtually empty. Yet people were queuing up outside for 30 to 45 minutes uh, to go in this one. And, and as a consequence, they're oversubscribed. And people recommend that, uh, that uh, place you know, to others, their friends. And uh, if they changed anything about that experience, their reputation would be destroyed um, overnight. So it's always about surprising and delighting. And so people want to refer you into others. And as a quick case in point, um, you know, this uh, dominant, uh, great people, we've worked with them as uh, clients. Um, they initially came on board to have a little bit of uh, help with, uh, at a personal level with their business because they've been friends since the age of four, believe it or not. Um, and uh, what's been really exciting, they've adapted very well to the new world order and they're in facilities management, and they're lo lovely people to work with. And this also goes back to this tribe um, leader scenario. So think about who is in your tribe, uh, who, could, who can be good referrers of business. And this also ties in with supply, supply, surprising and delighting people, so creating raving fans. A little bit Americanize that phrase, but it is true. Uh, then look at your upsells and cross-sells, member get member offers, and look at what you can put in place about referral systems. Um, going back a while ago, this like 10 or 15 years ago, through a different venture that I was running at the time, we managed to fight, put together a, ref a referral network and raving fans, as it were, of over 3,000 people. And we also struck partnerships with uh, six major insurance partners and retailers. So if you get this right, it can really underpin a lot of what actually goes on. Um, so, again, with your optimized, what we've covered is really all these seven parts here. Uh, these are really the seven key elements you should have in your business. It's the optimized system for business growth. If you do this as well, you can bring your sales forward, amplify your time and brand rather, and get your time back. And it it's, will be the true engine for growth. Um, and uh, I got, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to come to the, uh, I'm going to share um, what's coming up over the next week or so. In just a moment but also i'm going to come back to any questions as well so um if with those questions you've got questions coming up if you could type them in the chat now uh, please have those ready um and that what, what i look at when i look at those about two or three minutes time we'll go through those and make sure those get covered off as well so i've got quite a pace there i want to share lots of value and hopefully you've got lots out of it but um in terms of coming on to next week so a bit of change of tone here uh, we've got a lovely guest coming on next week. In fact, Mural, uh, you remember Jim very well, I think. I think Renato and several others you will remember him as well. He's uh, He did a lovely uh, uh, live stream with us about six months ago. I have asked him whether he'd do something again. Um, and this ties in really around your brand value proposition, both at a personal level, but also 
uh, at a, in a business context as well. So he's going to be talking how to create lasting change in your life, the hidden obstacles that hold you back and your, uh, hold you and your business back, greater understanding of why you may not be achieving your goals, how our lack of self-awareness costs us more than we realize the power of living in flow for you and your team and techniques to create lasting change in your life. Um, Jim is one of the nicest people, people you wish to be. He's also, um, you know, very trendy what he does. He loves a lot of free, what's what, free camping? There's, uh, loves camping in the wild um, and all this type of stuff. So uh, anyway, moving on from that, um, we've only just had one mini conference, but the next one's on the 4th of May, uh, which is a, um, where we spend a lot more time on these individual parts. We have a LinkedIn bonus session as well. And if you want to access any of these, by the way, from the homepage of our website, you can book onto the next mini conference uh, from there. Uh, there's also an on-demand webinar. Now, the webinar is does need to be updated because obviously these services are being introduced now. It will take me perhaps a couple of weeks to just upgrade that, but um, you'll still get massive amounts of value from that. So do feel you can free to join in it. Obviously, every Thursday at five o'clock, uh, BST or GMT plus one. Uh, we've got our live stream uh, with different guest speaker each week. And do feel free to complete the diagnostic. And the way you get to that is, if you haven't done it already, it's businessgrowthbureau.tv uh, forward slash diagnostic. And you'll get sent through a nine page, it's an eight or nine page personalized report with uh, some key stats there. And obviously that you could very much book a call in with us. So here are the contact details. Um, if you do want to reach uh, Miro or myself, so please do uh, reach out through that. And what we're going to do now is we're going to come back to everyone so I can at least see the screen properly now, which would be nice. Uh, so let's come back and see Mural as well. So there we go, Mural. We've got you back. <laughs> okay. Um, so Mural, any questions we've, which perhaps you've sort of missed along the way? Uh, yeah, Simon, Simon's just asked, interesting point you made about the return of face-to-face -face networking. Do you think the appeal of online meeting will be sustained? Uh, that's an interesting point, actually, because there are certain platforms that sprang up. Obviously, Zoom benefited ma massively out of uh, the pandemic. We know what their sales figures have been, uh, and their increase in profits. Uh, there's other platforms that sprang up as well, and a couple of those have dramatically increased their pricing over the last uh, six months as well. But I think they're making a big mistake, some of those platforms, I'm not referring to Zoom, because Zoom is so entrenched in terms of what we're doing. Um, because I think the new new model really is hybrid. Um, so, you know, our, at the moment, all our packages are based on online. But before that, we were running a mixture of online and physical events. In real terms, we will almost certainly go back to running some physical events as well. And I'd personally, I actually believe that as soon as people feel safe, and I think that's a crucial thing, um, you know, obviously, thank goodness, over 30 odd million of us being vaccinated, um, I think things actually will start to come back to normal much more quickly than uh, than we think. And um, I think people will be craving the human interaction. Um, so um, I know, Terry, you're a big believer in that as well. Um, you personally like the face-to-face -face contact with people. Um, and at the end of the day, especially if it's a higher ticket sale as well, the human interaction, being able to read the body language, being able to adapt to what's being said, is great. And now, interesting enough, Alex Ridden, I'm using your name slightly in vain here, Alex. I know very successfully um, over a long period of time when you were at IBM, and I think you said this publicly, so I think I'm safe to say it, when you had 5,000 people reporting to you, um, you actually managed to make an online model work very well uh, for you and your teams. Uh, so it'd be an interesting point, but if a healthy debate is always a good thing on that one. Um, so other points there, questions, Mural? Um, no, no, I don't think anybody, mind you, I've, I've got quite a few that came through by email and people asked via LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, um, actually, just uh, before we do that, Mural, actually, yeah. sorry, there's one I think we may have missed. Um, if, any, if, if, any, if I've missed, Mural, I've missed any of your questions, by the way, just put your question again in the chat, because what happens, they all scroll off the edge of the screen uh, and then we can't see them. OK, or well, we can. It's very easy to miss them. Um, but actually, Simon's also asked, uh, and hang on, there was another question here. Did I, I just missed it? Uh, oh, yes. Um, right. Do you see a difference between hybrid and digital first, maybe a bit more complex than hybrid? Yeah, I, this is, a, yeah, it's this big question, Simon. I'd love to be able to answer that. I think what we'll do with the physical meetings we do, we're actually going to stream them live. It was a lot of things we weren't, we weren't doing that before. 
uh, we were typically running physical meetings um, and we weren't, we were put then recording them and then we were distributing the content afterwards. This is providing the meetings, of course, weren't under Chatham House rules. I think there'll be much more move to actually streaming these live, especially for our members, for example, is we'll give the option for people to be able to, if they can't attend physically, to actually be able to watch it live, possibly in a closed Facebook group or LinkedIn group, um, or uh, maybe through some other bit, link or means, if that makes sense. Uh, so, Miro, sorry, was there another question there? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. <laughs> Miro, we can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I missed that one. It was I was scrolling to the top. Um, nothing that anybody's asked here. We did have some through um, earlier. Um, John asked, how can I achieve greater results in less time? Which um, I think you've covered as well. Yeah. Um, how does my business stay relevant in the new world order? Jackie asked that one. Yeah, and I, I think this is another one because I think a lot of coaches, for example, trainers, consultants, have got so used to things being online now uh, uh, yeah. that they they may have they may be surprised about the amount of move to actually want to have the physical contact again. So what I would just say is plan for what's coming ahead because very quickly in the next few weeks, you know, God willing, God willing is it, it we will be returning to some sense of normality and people will be craving that human contact again, I believe. Um, so uh, it's interesting. T in Terry's raised a the question there as well, I think, isn't he? Um, yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh, Terry, again, I know you've been involved in he very high ticket sales, haven't you, up to perhaps several million pounds. Um, and the social element there, I guess, can be really important because of making sure the, the major stakeholders in making that decision feel enfranchised uh, in making that decision and, and presenting you as being a very safe pair of hands. I can get that uh, uh, straight away. Sorry, Mural, you were going to ask, was there another question? No, no, I think we're done. I think we're done. Okay. All right. Well, lovely. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining in, everyone, today. Hopefully you've all enjoyed it. Uh, just let me know in the chat, actually. Um, I feel I've gone very fast today. Um, obviously, I have shared a lot of content, but if you feel that we could have done anything a little bit better, by all means, put that in the chat or the comments. Don't be shy on coming forwards because I learn from this, okay? And it is about always making sure that we meet a need. So just tell us what you think. If you've enjoyed today, uh, then great. Really appreciate it. And next week, as I say, uh, do join us with Jim's um, session. That'd be a really good one. Very different in style. It'll be much more me interviewing him. He'll be asking lots of questions, hardly any slides. So we're going to be going back to the traditional format. Uh, so uh, anyway, a very big thank you for you joining in today. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all next Thursday. And uh, you take care of yourselves. Have a great week. So thank you very much indeed. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.